Hello everyone, good morning and welcome. Today is the 17th of May 2018 and we're here again with Te Techno Crime Fighters Forum episode number 61. I'm Ramola D and I'm here this morning with uh, Dr. Catherine Horton, particle physicist from CERN, currently in Hungary, and uh, NSA whistleblower Karen Stewart, currently in the US, like myself. So we're here this morning to talk about a variety of things. So one of the things that we'd like to do is touch on the news, what's been happening in the news lately, a few particular items of note, and how these items relate to the issues of surveillance, surveillance abuse, torture, and the use of anti-personnel electromagnetic technologies or directed energy technologies and neurotech, highly sophisticated neurotech use on civilians, both here in the United States and in Europe, all very extrajudicially, extra-constitutionally, illegally, illegitimately, and so on. Basically, weapons are being used in the populace without public acknowledgement, but with sufficient information from scientists and from whistleblowers to attest to the fact of their usage. So on that note, I'm going to turn the floor over perhaps to Catherine, and she can talk about one of the most profound events that occurred recently, and I think this was at the Gina Haspel hearing, right, um, on the Capitol, in the Capitol, um, in front of the Senate Intel Committee, etc., um, and what happened to a very important activist and whistleblower in our midst, Ray McGovern. Thank, thank you, Ramola. I um I would like to um <clears throat> put a lot of emphasis um on what happened there because it's uh symptomatic uh for what's happening around the country. Um, but before I do so, can I please take literally two minutes just to make a very short announcement? Um, and this is an announcement I made last week, but not properly and not at the right time, not at the beginning of the show. Um, I would like to announce that um, the, the draft version for the short affidavit survey is finished and is published on my um, website. And I would like to invite comments. Now, last time I mentioned this, um, I did not tweet it out and the affidavit draft was not linked from the um, front of my website. So let me just show you what I mean now. Um, okay, so, sorry. Uh, oh, hang on. It's this one here. So if people please go to my website on stop007.org, the very first link under news, this is the affidavit survey and the draft is now ready for comments. Um, the final draft should have been published this Sunday, but because of extreme attacks on me that I will talk about um, some more later, I, I had to delay it by a week. And also I got a really large number of very, very good comments that I would like to incorporate into the affidavit. But um, because only part of the community heard about this, I would like to give it another week. So please um, go here and um, click on this link um, and you will see the, um, the short, um, the short version of this affidavit, um, and it has a public part and a private part, and otherwise consists of these um, uh, uh, tick box, um, you know, of a tick box survey. Um, what I would like you to do is go through. Please do not fill it in like as your final version yet, because there might be changes to the ordering here and the numbering. But if you go through and then kind of almost like a quiz, just fill it in. When you, when you actively fill it in, you are much more likely to think of stuff that is missing or comment on the why it's awkward, why it's maybe not the way it should be drafted or maybe why the uh, choice of words is wrong and so on. So please go through. It is very long. It's 45 pages. But then again, it is just actually one line, you know, for each offense. Um, so it's very, very quick to actually fill it out. And I, I ask you to just print it off and start, um, you know, playing with it. So start filling it out. Um, but do not fill it out as your final version, please. Um, this is just so that people actually, um, you know, uh, come come across things that, uh, that might be missing. What I would like to emphasize is that <clears throat> at the very, very front, um, there's a... Um, a private information section that will not be published. There's an, an anonymous middle bit that starts here. 
Um, and at the very end, there's another bit that's private, specifically private, but includes um, it includes um, a list of perpetrators and a dying declaration. Okay, and here you can put in all the the names or the the people you know have been involved. Um, this is for the investigation, but it will not be published. But what I'm including here is that um, this is missing in this current version. There's an option that you say that this information can or even should be published should anything happen to you. Okay, and in that case, um, your dying declaration, if you so wish, will be sent to um, all the police forces and so on and will be used in court cases. Otherwise, this is entirely private. But I thought once we are collecting, you know, um, lists of, of perpetrators, um, we maybe should give people the option to use it, uh, you know, should they so wish. So, but this would only be, it would not be published any other way, only if, if um, you know, the conditions um, are satisfied under which you give us permission. Um, but otherwise, this is also still just public, but um, I ask for it because for the internal investigation, this would be, you know, worth gold. Um, okay, so this is the, the affidavit draft. Um, and um, so please have a look at it now. I've linked it from the front. Um, and please send all your suggestions to my email, which is here, contact at stop 7org And the final version should be really, sorry, it shouldn't read Sunday, it should read Thursday. So the 24th is next Thursday, um, and that will be at the, um, next week's Techno Forum. So that is when I will release this um, draft on the 21st of May 2018. So until then, please, please, please um, send me all your comments and um, you know, let me know. This is super important that we um, start collecting this. Okay, so now this is the short affidavit draft. I'll tweet it out and I'll you know um, pass it around and please spread spread the link um, to all and sundry because I want everybody to um, to have a chance to comment on it before um, you know this thing is published. Okay, so this is about the affidavit draft. Now, returning to um, Ray McGann, I would like to um, bring up um, an item of news that unfortunately got shut down, hang on. So um, what happened is that there was a committee hearing um, and um, sorry, I'll probably find the video and um, I would like, I would invite people to actually, um, uh, here, I think here it is. Um, let, uh, let me see, I'm, I'm looking for the page that has the actual full video. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen uh, and show you what I mean. So uh, here, so this is now the article um, that appeared on uh, May 10th. Um, and this is the, um, this is the the uh, what actually happened at the hearing, and this was the the hearing um, in which um, Gina Huspel was um, to be confirmed. Her nomination was to be confirmed um, as the next uh, director of CIA. And the issue is that um, this woman, uh, maybe there's a picture of her here, is said to be involved in uh, or what uh, is said to have been involved in overseeing torture at various black sites abroad. I think Thailand is one prominent place. Um, and um, it implies that she actively condoned torture and there are reports that she actively took part in torture and that she was known as Bloody Gina, for example, for her ruthlessness and brutality and that she specifically um, liked torture for the sake of torture. Um, so this is all going back to the CIA so-called en enhanced interrogations, which I personally think were actually enhanced sadomasochistic uh, porn uh, sessions that were probably recorded and then sold on the black market. This is what I would assume because they would they had absolutely no relevance for national security. Absolutely none. None of the information that was, um, you know, obtained during torture had any value or could have had any value given the trillions of dollars that are spent on defense, uh, uh, you know, of the um, American military industrial complex. So this is all nonsense. But what happened at the hearing is that um, Ray McGowan um, asked a question when questions or public comments were invited. And he specifically, um, I think here, uh, I'm looking for the quote. So please re read the article yourself because, um, and there's there's many, many interviews by Ray McGowan that you can actually uh, look at. One is by RT, 
where he says himself what's what happened but it was a very innocent question and it was uh, related to uh, Gina Haspel overseeing torture in Thailand, I think. And what happened is that upon asking this question, these police officers, so-called uh, capital police, and I, I say so-called because I rather think that the term police is a misnomer. I think it might be corporate branding to mislead you to think that these people are actually um, you know, police officers related to the American state. I personally think, although this has to be checked, that they are most likely a private goon squad operated by the private corporation that owns uh, Washington, D.C., the District Columbia extraterritorial private area not belonging to the U.S. Um, so I don't know, but there was a group of thugs wearing police-like costume, I would say, who dragged uh, Ray McGowan out, and um, I, I will look for the video, and um, then pushed him to the ground and tortured him. And this is recorded on video, people, okay? So um, it's already public knowledge that um, his uh, right shoulder has been dislocated on a previous attack on him by so-called police. And um, what these goons did is actually, um, force his shoulder backwards even though he told them that his shoulder was dislocated this man is um you know far over 70 and he was forced to the ground and then they these thugs thought that they there was a need to handcuff him just because he asked a question um and how anybody anywhere in the world can possibly think for a nanosecond that this is justified is beyond me. But trained so-called police officers really should know better because there was absolutely no reason to use force. If you actually count the number of people surrounding this man who is unarmed, right? There's, I think, six or eight people. You don't need six or eight people to force uh, a man over 70 to the ground and then torture him, you know, by trying to force his... Uh, previously dislocated arm backwards. So that we actually saw was an active torture session of a high profile CIA whistleblower. And the reason why it's such a bombshell is because all this happened at a hearing which was to examine the role of Gina Haspel in torture. And we have an active torture session happening literally in front of the committee and no one bats an eyelid. So for me, that means that this woman and the entire committee actively condones torture. And this why it might, ex might explain why Gina Haspel, as far as I know, has now been confirmed. Her nomination has been confirmed, despite all these reports. Oh, yes, and despite the fact that there's an arrest warrant has been applied for against her. Um, this happened in June 2017, so almost a year ago, and the arrest warrant was requested from the federal prosecutor of Germany under international um, uh, ju universal jurisdiction, which means that um, human rights violations anywhere in the world can be um, uh, prosecuted in certain, um, certain jurisdictions that have signed uh, the international law pertaining to it. So the, the federal prosecutor of Germany sat on this arrest warrant for almost a year, nothing has happened, but the fact remains that the charity has applied based on evidence you know, for an arrest warrant. And this is the, the sort of woman who actually is in line to be put into jail and really for the rest of her life is now to be made head of CIA. Okay, so this is this is the story, and now I'll pass the microphone to to Karen. And in the meanwhile, meantime, I'll look for the video because I really think people should see what happened. Oh, I was just going to briefly say I believe that Mr. McGowan's one of his questions, if not the one that he got dragged out for, because I didn't see the video. Um, one of his questions was, why would we appoint somebody to head a CIA CIA who is not free to travel? and may be arrestable if she, if she travels to a foreign country on U.S. business. What sense does that make? And that he's right. Why would we nominate anybody for any position that could be yanked off a plane and arrested uh, under international treaty or law? That's insane. And uh, very clearly, this woman, <laughs> I, you know, anybody who thinks about it twice has uh, doubts about her fitness you know, to be the head of anything, you know. So I, I praise Mr. McGowan for going up there and saying, yes, there are people from the CIA who actually have a conscience. 
and we do not support her just because she's female. You know, you elect the you, you appoint the first uh, female head of the CIA. Well, you know, quality might have something in in uh, the nomination at some point. You know, you can't just go by gender or hair color or whatever. You know, quality might be something to put for first and foremost. You know, not somebody who continues the uh, American bullying of foreigners, you know, for no apparent reason other than she can. So I'm not real happy with the nomination myself because I think it just continues the uh, psychopathy that we're seeing in the intelligence community. And, uh, <laughs> well, you see what happens when you speak out and say, we'd rather not have a psychopath, thank you. Then you get attacked by lesser psychopaths, <laughs> you know. So, but uh, like I said, I do praise him for his efforts. Um, and it is too bad that she's been, she's been uh, appointed. That's, that's a poor choice, I believe. Oh, is that the latest? She's actually been appointed now? Um, I'll have to double check. I thought she was, but uh, I'll, I'll double check that. So I don't misspeak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll look into that. But you know, the the point that you bring up is so important that uh, Ray McGovern tried to draw attention to that very fact that I think Catherine had done in the last one of our recent podcasts, right, where she um, talking about how she's actually wanted for arrest abroad. So because of her participation in these black sites, these black rendition sites, and the use of waterboarding and uh, extreme torture on people in her custody. Absolutely. And if I may just bring that up again, because I, I found some interesting details in that. So um, yeah. this is the, the um, uh, English version site of ECCHR. So this is a, a charity um, trying to support uh, human rights and so on in Germany. And um, here it says, Germany, CIA deputy Gina Haspel must face arrest on traveling to Europe. Okay, so it says ECCHR's legal intervention filed with the German federal prosecutor, the General Bundesanwalt, catchy name, is aimed at securing an arrest warrant for CIA deputy director Gina Haspel. Okay, so um, on and on it goes, and here's the case against her. Um, and then the context here is, is very important. This submission is a follow-up to a criminal complaint on the U.S. torture program filed by ECCHR with the German prosecutors on 17th December 2014. Now, this is already 2014, right? So almost four years ago. Um, but the current one was filed um, here by ECCHR on 6th of June, 2017. This is against Gina Haspel, okay? But now it goes on to say, ECCHR is calling uh, for an investigation into the US torture program as a whole and all the members of the government, CIA and military who bear responsibility for the program. ECCHR accuses Tenet, Rumsfeld and the other named suspects of the war crime of torture under Article 8, Paragraph 1, um, slash three, three of the German Code of Crimes under International Law. The acts of torture occurred as part of the U.S. program, was confirmed in the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee report. Okay, now this is a very important one to quote for all the TIs, right? In Germany, Article 8, Paragraph 1, uh, slash 3 of the German Code of Crimes under International Law. Okay, so that's the one... Uh, the war crime of torture, which applies to every single um, TI, um, because they are being attacked by the military and uh, military intelligence in many cases, um, you know, with military weapons um, as civilians, which under the Geneva Conventions counts as a war crime. But um, I want to point to this. This is the actual um, um, warrant for arrest. But then there's other um, high profile um, intelligence whistleblowers who spoke out against Gina Haspel. So uh, Ray McGovern is not the only one. And then Karen, uh, Karen is not uh, the only one who is um, unhappy with this. There's an article by uh, John uh, uh, is Kiriaku, is that how to pronounce his surname? I'm sorry, I'm always insecure. But he wrote an article um, called The Conservative Case Against Gina Haspel, um, published on the 8th of May here. And um, it's really worth reading because he is um, going into a lot of detail and talks about his personal knowledge of what actually happened. And it really um, underlines that um, 
she was uh, instrumental in this. But um, this article and an article linked from here down there about the torture program, that's another one here, is called Gina Haspel as if Nuremberg never happened uh, by Peter van Buren. Uh, March 19th of this year. So yes, as if Nuremberg never happened. Don't we all know that uh, sort of feeling? But here, um, this article goes into great detail about the type of types of crime that have been happening and have been uh, committed um, at these um, CIA black, um, black sites. And um, also in these two articles, um, it also becomes clear that there was CIA personnel specific tortured personnel invited to come on site to do the maiming, mutilation and torture. And then they traveled on because they had more sites to visit. Now we need to get not just the name of Gina Haspel, we also need to get the names of those psychopathic serial killers because this is what they are. These are highly damaged, mentally ill, psychopathic individuals, right? Who have been trained up and are being run by the CIA. And I think now it's time that we really put names and faces to these uh, these crimes, okay? And also, um, when you see these photographs, uh, never miss the subtle satanic symbolism here with the upside down uh, star, you know, the satanic pentagram in the background next to the happy smile that tells you a lot. But one of the things, if um, please, if you indulge me a bit longer, I really would like to take uh, the time to show you what actually happened, okay? And I think it's this one here. Police brutalized 78 year old CIA whistleblower protesting a torturer, Gina Haspel Senate hearing. Okay, so I hope this shows the full. When veteran CIA officer Ray McGovern protested at the Senate confirmation hearing for Gina Haspel, President Donald Trump's nominee for CIA director, Capitol Police responded by violently brutalizing the 78 year old whistleblower. Stop resisting! Stop resisting! Stop resisting! And in many respects, in many respects, you guys go into the secret Stop resisting! Yes, you are. Give me your arm. Give me your arm. I'm lying on. I'm like, give me your arm. It's dislocated, man. Give me your arm. My left arm. Give me your arm. My left arm is dislocated. Give me your arm. Stop hurting him. I'm trying to stand. My left arm is. McGovern worked as a CIA analyst for 27 years and prepared the presidential daily brief for Ronald Reagan. Since leaving the agency, McGovern has become an outspoken activist. He disrupted the Senate confirmation hearing for Gina Haspel on Wednesday, May 9th. McGovern condemned Haspel for overseeing a CIA black site, a secret prison in Thailand where detainees were tortured and where the CIA destroyed evidence of that torture. Ali McCracken, a campaigner for Amnesty International, captured shocking video of the police violently pulling the elderly CIA whistleblower out of the hearing. The human rights campaigner told the police, quote, shame on you for hurting him. That was unnecessarily excessive. McGovern told the cops, quote, I wish you wouldn't beat up an old man. The full unedited video follows. Before I show this again, I, because we've seen it before, I would like you to now actually look at this and pick out absolutely everything that is a crime here. First of all, you have, as you know, um, before we got on the show, we talked about this and um, Ramola pointed out that you have these thugs, because frankly, these people are thugs, shouting, stop resisting as they are dragging a man out. How on earth can you resist when you're being almost lifted off the ground by these two big, you know, men? But remember, their voices become paramount in this little piece of street theater here, you know, that's being played out. They are yelling and shouting and their heads off, you know, and going on the record. And what they're saying is stop resisting, giving to any bystander who's perhaps not viewing it the impression that somebody is resisting when yeah. actually the opposite is going on. Exactly, exactly. And, and uh, you know, I think what the, the entire room should have shouted 
is stop torturing, stop the, torturing. You know? The entire room should have stood up. This was yeah. the, you know, this was at a hearing for the CIA director. Torture yeah. is on the on the menu here. Torture is a subject or under discussion. The entire room should have stood up. You know, if we were talking about real human, empathetic humans sitting together and working together, they should have stood up. They should have registered a protest. Nobody apparently did. But it's uh, amazing and fantastic that there's one Amnesty International worker uh, recorded the whole thing. Absolutely. And and one of the things I would like people to keep in mind is that this room is filled. So Gina Haspel sits here. As this entire thing is unfolding, she doesn't even turn her head because, frankly, she doesn't give a shit. Right. She was just asked a question about her torture record and she can't be bothered to even look to check if her former colleague, because this is what Ray McGovern is, what happens to her? She can't be bothered then you have the entire Very good point and remember she had the mic the mics were right there in front of her she could have easily have spoken up herself and said please you know let him speak exactly or please gentlemen can you stop this bullshit you know anything mm -hmm. then we have the entire do not manhandle him. you know do not touch him do not manhandle him he has a right to speak he was exercising his right to speech Absolutely. And on the interview on RT, he, um, uh, Ray also explains how the, the entire committee invited comments. There were actual questions upon which he stood up with a question. So it wasn't even that he was interrupting. This is a total lie. He wasn't interrupting anything. But then also look at all these people who are watching the entire thing. Now, if these people watch a scene like that and don't speak up, it means that they cannot recognize torture even when it's in their face. These people are not fit to be in the panel to start with because they are sociopaths or psychopaths themselves. These people, especially the head of the committee, and Mr. Burr, right? He is not fit for office. He's not fit for office because he's mentally ill. This is what it means, because no normal person would ever watch a scene like that and think, holy fuck, what's going on? It looks like a scene out of the Nazis. Right. It's like it's like they're apologists for torture when they see a scene like this unfold in front of them and none of them raises a finger, none of them raises their voice and says, this is unacceptable, please stop. You exactly, know? exactly. And I would go even a step further and I would I would say if the cameras had been pointing at the faces of the head of the committee and Gina Haspel, they might have, they might have picked up an, a micro expression of glee. I would actually go that far because frankly, what we know about Gina Haspel for sure is that she enjoys this sort of stuff, right? She actually enjoys it. Well, so a very important aspect of what Gina Haspel has done regarding this rendition site that she was in charge of is she's destroyed videotapes. She, she destroyed 90 videotapes of those interrogation sessions, so-called interrogation sessions. Let's call them what they are, torture sessions. Exactly. 90 videotapes destroyed by Gina Haspel. Remember that Richard Helms, former director of the CIA, destroyed the tapes related to MK Ultra, possibly of children being tortured. Absolutely. And George Bush, the first George Bush, destroyed and got rid of massive amounts of uh, CIA evidence, um, which ended up in the papers that Charles Schland wrote about in his affidavit in his lawsuit against George Bush. Absolutely. And I say that what all this proves is that these people are first and foremost members of a criminal network. They are not there for the national security of the US. If they were, they would be up in arms about an American, right, exercising his invited right to speak. Right. They would be up in arms, but they're not. And that's because they do not represent the American people. They represent an organized crime outfit. And I would, and this is now my personal um, gut feeling and educated guess, I would say that it's pretty impossible to delete or destroy evidence of such uh, high profile uh, and, and such, in, in inverted commas, worth as the MK Ultra tapes or any other tapes. I would say that they just faked it and that there are many copies, not least with other intelligence agencies, right? 
I'm I'm a hundred percent sure that all this information is still out there and still can be gotten hold of. And in in case of any doubt, people might want to go back to the original CIA headquarters in Switzerland and maybe look in some sort of you know uh, bunker there where this this data might still be stored. Because I bet you. All the information is still there. And then another thing I would like to say is that my gut feeling is that all this video footage from Guantanamo and from these black sites is being sold as VIP porn. I think these are VIP porn sessions and they are going for a lot of money. So I, I still think that these videotapes are out there. But um, the fact that these people claim that they were deleted shows that they are actively perverting the course of justice, which is a crime, you know. But this is just this bit, but now analyze in detail because the reason why I want us to spend so much time on this particular thing is that I want to put to you that we have become far too desensitized to grave crimes being committed in front of our eyes and like this huge group of people, no one speaks up. I mean, first of all, to all the intelligence and uh, intelligence um, whistleblowers out there, next time, please go together in one big gang, have literally 50 people planted in the audience. If stuff like this happens, which happens every single time, you have one after the other standing up and saying what we have witnessed is a crime. And you keep saying that in one big choir so that that also gets recorded on footage like that. And you know? also, and also, when, if something like this happens and you've got police, you know, bellowing at the top of their lungs, stop resisting, you could have people in the audience, concerned people like that in the audience, shouting out, you know, stop torturing, you know, exactly. stop manhandling, stop assaulting, because that's it's what's really going on. Yes, and stop these terrorists, stop these terrorists who are, who have been, I mean, you know, what tells us that these people are actually licensed police officers? Did anybody check? Or are they just private street theater actors putting on caps, you know? I mean, we have that with our, this, the street theater actors we know, they, they wear all sorts of stuff. How hard is it to put on this sort of, uh, you know, uniform and masquerade, you know, a group of thugs as so-called police officers? You know, I, the first thing that needs to happen, and not that uh, Ray Mc, um, McGovern is handcuffed, but what needs to happen is that the badge numbers are collected of these thugs, and then immediately a formal complaint is submitted, first of all by the victim, and then at least 100 people in the room. You know, and these people need to be fired. But now look carefully, because the, what these people are doing is, is brutal. So just watch the scene. Stop resisting. Can you see any resistance? What I can see is that two grown men whack uh, a man over 70 into a row of chairs. That's what I see here. I don't see any resistance. And in many respects, in many respects, you guys go into secret fighting. Whoops, and did you see that? Uh, did you see what has been what this guy's carrying in his back pocket? It looks like white rope. Why would a security guard carry, you know, two meters of white rope? Are they about to hang somebody? Are they about to engage in a bondage session? You know, wh what the hell is this? White rope? Are they handcuffing people usually with white rope? Look at this. Look at this. How many people did you count? Pushing him to the ground violently. I count three thugs. And he says, my arm is dislocated, my left arm is dislocated, and these thugs are just shouting, give me your arm, give me your arm. Like, what? Are you fucking thick? So I really want the name of this thug, this criminal thug, and that criminal thug. I really want their badge numbers, their names, and I think we need to have an international arrest warrant for these guys because they're <laughs> And I wonder what that white rope is all about, Catherine. I wonder if that's Masonic signaling too, because, you know, they have this, um, the Masonic police apparently put out little symbols every now and then to kind of show that they are staging something. That is a very good point because, for example, white gloves are made some symbols. So maybe white rope. I mean, frankly, this should be the white rope by which the uh, leaders of these Masonic crime networks hang themselves. 
you know i i think the white rope is very opposite here but then also i want to blow up of this logo and find out if there's any masonic or satanic signaling in in that that's you good know? point. Yeah. i left the arm is just uh, kind of damn it Stop hurting him! I tried to stand. My and, then, and then, and then, stop hurting him. And this guy tells the woman to shut up, and then keeps watching. So I'm counting one, two, three, four guys. In addition to these three, actively torturing, standing by, and condoning the torture, and putting a protective fence around it so that no one can get at the criminals and stopping them from torturing this man. I mean. You know, I, the reason why I really spend so much time on this is because I want every single person to start thinking like that. How many criminal charges can we bring based on this evidence footage alone? And I would say at least seven men here can be charged. But then, now listen carefully to what he said. Yeah, I'm not fighting. I'm on the ground. Stop fighting. I mean, come on. You're hurting him. You guys are hurting me. Stop hurting him. I'm immobilized. I'm immobilized. You're going to dislocate my shoulder again. Look, would you pick up my glasses before you step on them? Why does this require a lot of How about giving me a two pack? Hold on. We're going to get you up first. I'm going to go, right? I can stand up by myself. Shame on you for hurting him. I'm not a terrorist. I'm a CIA. I'm on the side. 27 years. I was operation. Now sit up, sir. What a party. Head never. Sir, are you going to stand up for us, sir? I'll stand up. Stand up, please. Never. Come on, stand up for us. Let me get. 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 Let me Stand up, sir. That's Thank only you. a secret because she won't recuse herself. She won't keep my left or left. My left one is just for a break. I'll go out. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll go out. I, right. I, right. I, right. I, I wish that you would be up an old man. You decide how you want to do Okay, guys. So here. We can see all the faces clearly. So I am now, this is a challenge for everybody in the US. Can you please get the faces and the names and the badge numbers of these people, please? Because we need to have them arrested, okay? We really need to put it, and, and I'm not kidding. This is not a, you know, a, a little vacuous exercise. This is not, a, you can tweet as much as you like, I'm not talking to my team now who are working really hard. I'm talking to the audience. You can tweet about make America great again and hope for the president to do something for as long as you like. But unless you're willing to, to use your own witness testimony, right? You have seen the video footage now. Can you please submit a police complaint? And the other thing I think you should do is find out, is Capitol Police a licensed police service? Or are they a private corporation? Who owns them? Who pays them? Who the F are these thugs? Who trains them? We have no idea. We have absolutely no idea who these people are, and yet you're all sitting there watching live torture and thinking this is fair enough. I mean, uh, what sort of police procedures? I mean, literally here in Europe, things are bad, but stuff like that I have not witnessed, and I have not witnessed it even in the communist system. Because we do not wrestle people above 70 to the ground. We do not wrestle them to the ground just because they said something. We don't wrestle anybody to the ground in Europe, typically. You know, you don't need to handcuff people who just said something. You know, you know, Catherine, this brings up so much. And I'm so glad you played that whole thing out because it was so disturbing and so un unsettling to watch. But I think it really drove home the point of what's happening over here. This was a vicious display of public aggression that was actually condoned by the CIA officers in that room supporting Gina Haspel. You know, do you, it seems to me as if the powers that be, the so-called authorities who are permitting this to happen, who are not speaking out, who are, you know, on that podium over there with Gina Haspel and not speaking out, thereby permitting it to happen. It appears to me that this, the set, this coterie of people who are occupying positions of power and authority are sending a message to the public 
a very vicious message of public bullying, public harassment, public persecution, and public assault of a CIA whistleblower. You know, and in fact, this is very interesting because I just recently, yesterday, I published this uh, video um, podcast that I did with Barbara Hartwell, another CIA whistleblower. And one of the things she spoke about was whistleblower retaliation, retaliation against those from government agencies who speak out. The vicious retaliation, the extremely abusive retaliation. And I think that's what we're seeing evidence of here with Ray McGovern. And you know, it's very interesting interesting because this is at a time period when Julian Assange, as we know, is sitting in the Ecuadorian em embassy and Ecuador now has a new president, etc. Um, new policies, all of them supported by the US. We, we're seeing Julian Assange being tortured in the heart of London. By who? By apparently three, three parties, the Ecuadorian embassy, the US government and the UK government. These three appear to be complicit in the torture of Julian Assange, another whistleblower, a journalist who is engaging in public information and public interest journalism. So you see, we are getting thug messages from the so-called people in power. They are really shaming themselves by what they are doing. And what we've seen with Ray McGovern kind of really drives home the point. I absolutely agree. And I think we should cycle to the next step. And because so far we have always um, complained about um, they are doing this and, you know, this is happening and they are doing this to us and they want to take over the world. And now we need to move in 2018 to putting precise names and badge numbers and office numbers and telephone and addresses to these they, who they are, because we know exactly who they are. And this is the final step that we need to do before we then move to arrest them. And if the police refuses and if the courts refuse to act on the law of the land, the courts need to be totally removed. Uh, these judges need to be sacked. These police officers need to be sacked. And we need to reestablish proper common law courts that respect the divine right of human beings, their, their rights to life, their rights to health, and their right to free speech and public protection. And that has totally gone out of the window. But now I really am advocating to put personal responsibility back on the map. And these, these so-called police officers, I'm still not convinced that there are any police officers in that picture. Um, these people who are masquerading as police officers, they do have a personal responsibility and a personal liability. And I'm saying what they did there was on their personal initiative. They might even have, as Ramola rightly said, maybe even displayed Masonic signaling because I really don't know what right, right rope is doing in, in the picture there. You know, was were they trying to cordon stuff off with white rope? You know, was there any white rope anywhere else in the building? These are extremely important questions because cartel signaling is present. And it can be an organized crime network. And, you know, I think the question that you brought up is also very important. Is this a private corporation? You know, ultimately, we need to ask that question. I'm telling you, I think at this point in time, with what surveillance has come to, with what, you know, public acts by these so-called authorities have come to, as we just witnessed, we have to ask the question, who are these people? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing this to, you know, a member of the public? In fact, a very respected member of the public. Ray McGovern, you know, who is a CIA whistleblower, whom everyone appreciates, whom everyone looks up to, because he's speaking out. Very few people are speaking out. We're looking up to the people who are speaking out, because we all need to speak out, really, you know, and we have to be inspired to speak out, and we need to take a stand at this point in time, or just forget it and, you know, have that um, boot grinding into our face forever and just sort of disappear into the vacuum of fascism. We can we can all sort of get, you know give it up and um, go scuttle you know or we start stand up and speak out. I think those are the two choices we we are faced with currently, because the surveillance state is absolutely out of control and people do have to speak out. So you know we have to ask that question: Who is doing this? Are the police actually a government service? Are they being supported by the government? What is the government? You know, is the government a private corporation? You know, is this? Um, uh, is the police department over here a private corporation? If it's a private corporation, why are we letting this particular private corporation uh, destroy and assault and persecute somebody like an outspoken activist? You know, I think those questions absolutely need to be asked at this point in time. And we do need to hold every single person accountable and every single one of these corporations accountable as well. 
Well, if we don't speak up, we are in a constitutional crisis and they will have won because what they're trying to get across to us is that you have rights on paper, but if you dare try to use them, we'll destroy you. And I did look up the Capitol Police and they are pretty much assigned to the legislative branch branch, and they have a concurrent jurisdiction with the Park Service and the D.C. Um, Metropolitan Police. So they are supposedly, quote unquote, real police. But these are also the same people who shot Miriam Carey in 2014 in the back and murdered her. They had a, a basically shot her because she turned down the wrong uh, street and was trying to turn around and leave. And I, I suppose that she was scared or maybe she panicked and didn't hear them. And they were, sh they were shouting for her to stop if she heard them, but she also had a child in the she back seat. She had a one-year-old baby in the back seat. And they hit the car with how many dozens of bullets? I mean, you know, a hundred rounds of bullets and they killed her and shot her from the back because she was such a danger going away from them. Um, yeah, these these police don't seem like they have much training other than maybe being hired as natural bullies. So this does not this not does not look well for them at all. I mean, to murder a woman with a child in the back seat with no no um, <laughs> hesitancy to shoot into a car with a one year old and much less a woman, you know. Oh, you know, how many men does it take to empty their guns into a car that's trying to drive away that clearly has a young woman in it? Um, so they they don't seem to earn any respect, you know, from the public. And like I said, if if police, if bullies in uniforms can get away with things that are just very blatantly illegal, then we've succumbed to the Constitution being a relic. And all we have to do is say, no, we demand that the Constitution be followed, not be um, thrown out. You know, it's not optional. But you're right. If we don't speak up now, we'll lose the right to speak up. We'll lose the ability to speak up. And indeed, that particular case with Miriam Carey, I mean, we have to ask the question, was anybody prosecuted? Were there any penalties for this police misbehavior on not such a saw. grand scale? that a fatality resulted, you know, that this woman was killed. And of course, you know, the story of Miriam Carey brings up the issue of neurotechnology. And that is another issue that we wanted to talk about today. But um, I let Catherine comment on any other aspects of this before we move on to how neurotechnology and police action are currently working hand in hand and people don't know about it. Yeah, I, I would like to say actually two things. One of them, I, I didn't even know about the uh, the case of um, Miriam Carey, and I have to look it up. But um, from what I've gathered, just from listening to you two, um, the one thing I would like to point out, I don't know where she drove her car and uh, where she was trying to turn around, but it is a fact, a fact I can prove using systems analysis and also circumstantial evidence that the city centers, and especially places like Washington, D.C., have number plate recognition and facial recognition and have had it for years and years. So there is no way that you can move in the public sphere in Washington, D.C. without your face being recognized and locked, much less so with a car. So there's no way that anyone can be shot without the police knowing who exactly they are. And this, the reason why we even entertain this idea is because we do not know how extensive the surveillance network is. It is massive. And um, the same holds true for all capital cities. You know, there are areas where you cannot move without detailed facial recognition. And um, there's no way that this poli the police officers couldn't have known who they were shooting. So I would rather go instead of just a, oh, it's a fatal shooting. I would go for two options. It was a targeted killing. Okay. It was, and you should know a few details about the background here, Catherine, to uh, help you understand what exactly happened. Miriam Carey was somebody who I think drove down from Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, I think, I forget the exact details. But she drove down because she was a victim of voice to skull technology. And she, she, the report stated that she was hearing the voice of Obama in her head telling her to go down to the White House. She drove down to the White House and apparently her car crashed into one of the gates 
Okay, I think on 17th Street, or I forget where exactly. But Secret Service police began to chase her. She tried to move away. She started getting chased by Secret Service police from the White House, and her car ended up at the Capitol. Literally, it's a straight run from the White House to the Capitol. You just go up Constitution Avenue, and you're at the Capitol, you know. So um, that's what happened to her. And apparently, the Capitol police gave ch chase to her as well. So I forget the exact details, whether it was Secret Service police, or Capitol Police who actually fired those shots. Perhaps it was Capitol Police. I think Karen may know more about that. I think it was the Capitol Police. Wow. Okay, guys. Uh, based on, let's, literally, this is, this is really important. I'm sorry I'm laughing. I'm not laughing because this case is horrific. But in, inscribed in those details is already the answer to this. Okay. My next thing. So I was, I was going to say this is a targeted killing. And then I wanted to say based on what? Um, eliminating a, an actual witness or something. Or the other option is there's only these two options. You know, they kill somebody because this person is about to do something or say something or they know something or they kill somebody for sport, as in a ritual sacrifice. Now, the symbolism of all this, right? Somebody is being induced by a voice to skull, which we know is going through the entire Lockheed Martin system, you know, most likely, to go all the way down. So there's no way to drive on a highway without number recognition, right? There's no way to drive to DC on a motorway without being recognized and logged by the CIA and all the bunch of agencies. In, you know, in D.C. at this area, the, you can't, you know, an aunt can't move without being monitored. And the other thing is this old fashioned thing of, oh, you need to actually shoot at the car to stop it. Well, I'm sorry, that was maybe the case in the 1960s. But my own car was very successfully stopped by a directed NG weapon being fired at it. This, the, the car stopped pretty much instantly. So Washington, D.C. is probably one of the places with the highest density of these sort of weapons for defense, as in the defense of the cartel. So there's no way you need to shoot at the woman to stop a car, right? So the fact that they made her crash into a gate and then chased her to execute her and kill her somewhere near Capitol, right? White House Capitol, this is the satanic, within the satanic triangle, to me is 100% human sacrifice. So this woman was selected she was probably hypnotized and, you know, told through subliminal messaging to do all this because they've done it to all of us, I think. I mean, certainly to um, Millicent um, and me, um, this sort of game. And then she was, you know, navigated down and then she was made to take part in this really elaborate human sacrifice ritual that has no resemblance of any sort of national security thing. Because if these people were really uh, scared of a terrorist, Right. I mean, first of all, they would know this woman's full background. Uh, they could assess her capabilities. Right. Uh, and at no point would they have to fire, you know, shoot at a car to actually make it stop. They could just use a directed energy weapon using either their, you know, fixed, what I would assume to be fixed point new weapons or one of their many stalker cars. You know, and if the traffic uh, in that area is anything like anywhere else in the world, you can't really get very far. Right, without the car in front of you. So there's no freaking way. It pretty much reminds me of this uh, false flag um, at the Charlie Hebdo uh, shooting, which was very peculiar, right? I mean, there's footage of this guy sh um, shooting uh, at one of these actors and, and the, the shot missing by half a meter and just puffing air onto the pavement because it was a, you know, an empty shot. But then also the entire story claimed that the terrorists fled through the entirety of Paris to escape to North Paris. I'm sorry, anybody who's ever been to Paris knows you can't even get to the next junction without being stuck in traffic. So how anybody can escape in a car in Paris is beyond me. You know, you know, I have to say things are getting more and more bizarre out there. I just looked up Miriam Carey's story and guess what I found? Not merely did I find that Secret Service and Capitol Police shot her car more than 20 times and killed her. What I also find is on February 26, 2018, another woman, young woman, Jessica Ford, intention, supposedly intentionally rammed into a White House gate with her car, with a gun in her hand, but was taken into custody without any, any shots being fired. In other words, police saved the day from Jessica Ford with a gun in her hand, intentionally ramming the White House checkpoint. 
Is this an odd echo or what? Valerie Carey, who is Miriam Carey's sister, has tweeted in February, you know, so this is the face of the woman who supposedly had a gun in her hand and was, you know, taken into custody, whereas my sister was unarmed, made a U-turn and drove away, but was chased down and gunned down. Okay, what this is, ladies and gentlemen, I would say this is cartel signaling, right? This is some sort of repeat echo and it has some sort so, of meaning within the cartel and they do stage this bull crap for their own internal messaging, blah. But it's total bull, right, from start to end. I mean Jessica Ford's picture on this Fox News article is all smiling. Like Oh, you could you share your screen just so that we can actually have a look? Because this okay. stuff Super important for, for all of our education and the investigation, I think. Yes, let me show you this. So a woman with a gun was not dangerous enough to shoot, but a woman with a child was. Yeah. Which, which totally fits with our theory that this is a war on women and fertility and reproduction. So actually a woman with a child, right? That's like the most dangerous thing to the new world order, right? I mean, she actually <laughs> reproduces. Oh my God. So do you see Jessica Ford over here in this Fox News article over here? And um, look at this inset of the picture of, you know, I think that's Miriam Carey's car probably. Or maybe it's Jessica Ford's car, the police. But um, this is the tweet from Valerie Carey. So this is the face of the woman who intentionally crashed a gate near the White House with a gun on her. My sister Miriam Carey was unarmed, no crime committed, made a U-turn and was gunned down. And, you know, we should actually, I should actually find a picture of Miriam Carey. I think what we need to do is when we get this sort of garbage from the crime cartel, we need to use it to educate ourselves about uh, cartel signaling. Because uh, that, that's the only stuff that this, these sort of things, these news articles are used for and these staged events. They don't have a, a purpose apart from carrying some sort of message for the cartel oh, she, followers. Yeah, she drove to DC from Connecticut. I thought it was Pennsylvania. Okay, I'm wrong. Connecticut with her baby daughter, a U-turn at a checkpoint led to her being killed and a slew of unanswered questions. This is actually from the Washington Post, which as we know is CIA run. Uh, so many questions, so much we still don't know about the case of the woman shot to death by the Secret Service and U.S. Capitol Police. Now, that was October 3, 2013, which is literally about five years earlier than this Jessica Ford incident. I, I, like, I like the fact that we should, from now on, refer to the Washington Post as the CIA-run Washington Post, you know? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think it's well known. I think it is well known. I don't think, you know, it's uh, just my opinion or anything. I think you're absolutely right. But anyway, I think this is a really good uh, homework because um, I, I tell you, the, uh, the other thing, um, so we've got so much to actually talk about today, but um, one of the things I... Um, I spent quite a lot of time here. So as, as people might know, I, I, I sought refuge in Hungary. So I'm now in Hungary. And before I came, I informed the prime minister, the um, Hungarian ambassador to Germany, and the, the uh, directors of the three main intelligence agencies uh, in Hungary that I will be coming here and that I will be seeking refuge. Now, what happened is that... Um, well, the ambassador ignored my request for asylum, as he did already on a previous occasion, months earlier. And But eventually, one of the heads of Intel replied, and um, they said, oh, we have, uh, here's our statutory duties in 40, on 40 pages, um, and we don't think that we're actually uh, in charge of your case, even though I reported uh, brutal attacks of direct energy weapons um, on myself in Hungary, and as an ethnic Hungarian and as somebody who holds a German passport, um, and um, I still have to post them all the other evidence. I was bruised up in the home of the, um, the family I'm staying with. Uh, they machine gunned bruises into my knee that at first, when the bruises was first formed, looked strikingly like a swastika. Uh, they bruised uh, an entire ring into my upper thigh, all of this happening at night. And despite the fact that I do sleep under a lead blanket, um, so it has been interesting, but um, 
as I was being, uh, yeah, hounded across the country, I had uh, a lot of opportunity to see a couple of places, including Budapest. And um, one of the things that was striking is just the cartel signaling in the architecture in Budapest. So I, we have literally Masonic and Satanic signaling and Satanic symbols um, on every street, uh, every hundred meters, every two hundred meters, pretty much in the in right at the center, and um, it has brought home to me just how old this entire crime cartel is, and the, the signaling is identical between Washington D.C., between London, Paris, and Budapest. So, and and the the buildings that I'm referring to, they are all from the 19th century or early 20th century. So. We're looking at a crime cartel that has been at it for a very, very long time, you know, as can be documented. And I, as I'm, I'm seeing the screen of uh, Ramola scrolling through this, I just encourage everybody to go through, analyze the images and try to pick up any sort of covert messages or cartel signaling in these sort of articles. So numbers, symbols, stuff that shouldn't be there, shouldn't be in the picture, anything. Uh, we need to find out what all this is about. Well, I have to say that, um, you know, let me stop sharing, actually. Um, I have to say, just looking briefly at this article, and of course, it is a um, Washington Post article. It completely, this is a 2014 article written after the fact, many months later. Uh, it's completely eluded any mention of the voices of uh, the Obama connection, et cetera, et cetera. It's totally wiped it out. And all it mentions is um, supposed postpartum depression and psychosis for which she was treated. And then it was a momentary breakdown and then she was fine you see this is the problem and this is where this is where um military technology is coming right up against the uh, specter of mental health and this is a very very vital issue i think to openly and publicly challenge and expose because what is happening is many many people are being hit in the populace as we know with exotic, highly sophisticated military neurotechnology, which is able to put voices in people's heads. And then when they report it, when they go to doctors, trying desperately, imagining they have a, a psychiatric problem and trying to get some help, you know, and when psychiatrists who are not educated, who are not informed of military neurotech, come in and start throwing antipsychotics at them, it doesn't help, obviously, because what's, what's really happening is they are under attack. They are under attack as experimental test subjects or as operational subjects. You know, they are as operational targets. They are under attack with military neurotechnology by groups who are, we must conclude, military or intelligence related. Who else would have access to this technology? You know, so um, I have to tell you that as I'm sitting here, I'm being attacked. Um, but this is quite, quite the norm as we very well know. So uh, directed energy technologies and neurotechnologies do exist and are in use and in experimental operation and in targeting, use, being used in targeting operations currently. And this is all part of this extremely bloated surveillance state that we um, are now seeing completely exploding in our midst. So we, that's something we need to be aware of. So um, this issue of neurotechnology being able to put voices in people's heads via voice to skull technology, via microwave hearing, via neurophone, uh, technology, etc. There are so many different ways, whether it's bone conduction, um, microwave hearing, or some other means, this technology does exist. And psychiatrists and doctors who are on the front line of seeing and hearing from people mentioning voices in their heads do need to be educated, do need to, you know, become literate 
about the state of the art regarding military technology today. Because unfortunately, if they do not get educated, what we're going to see is a repeat of this kind of incident. So you have Miriam Carey hearing voices, taking action, you know, because she actually imagines Obama is speaking to her that there is some kind of uh, connection with her. She actually begins to believe it because she's told to believe it because the voices are convincing enough. Right. And we also talked about, I think, Catherine, you've spoken ex extensively about how these voices could simply be through the use of a cochlear implant. Right. Simply with a microphone and speaker set up, they could transmit, transmit information. So you have this technology putting information into somebody's head and somebody actually taking action on it. And, you know, that's the other end of it. So if people don't know, people in the population need to know that this, these technologies exist. So exactly. if any... You know what I mean? So as a means of protection, if you hear voices, no, you're not schizophrenic. It's entirely possible you've suddenly become a target of military attack. Exactly. And one of the things I would like to say about that specifically about microwave hearing, I, I, I dug out a bit of information about the things we have said, but let me start with the um, microwave hearing. Let me just, um, and this is now, I've been in touch with one guy who has been trying to correct to remove the reference from conspiracy theory to conspiracy theories on the Wikipedia entry for microwave hearing. And what he has discovered is um, astounding. I'm not saying who it is yet because I haven't cleared with him that I'm at liberty to reveal his identity or, you know, what else or his um, I username as he's using um, on Wikipedia. But it's about this article on Wikipedia called the microwave auditory effect. And if you go to this, there's um, factual information here at the top. And then in, in section two, there's an entire paragraph on conspiracy theories, right? And um, quoting some California psychiatrist, Alan Dr Drucker or whatever, um, that he has identified evidence of delusional disorders on many of these websites and other psychologists are divided over whether such sites reinforce mental troubles or act as form of group social support. And these um, websites they are talking about are websites referencing Voice to Skull and the military technology that underlines underlies Voice to Skull. But the point is that when you read this article, you will meet some factual information here at the top and here in the middle maybe research in the us and then you will finish off with this entire paragraph on conspiracy theories and when the person editing wikipedia removed this um it was put back pretty much instantly and at first he was told um by wikipedia that the computer put it back and then he requested the log and he um realized that several users were putting um, this paragraph back. So he was making factual comments saying that this um, paragraph on conspiracy theories has nothing to do with the scientific fact of the microwave auditory effect. Absolutely nothing. In other words, this is priming by the crime cartel slash the intelligence agencies. And then he also um, got the usernames that were um, uh, doing this and let me just dig it out because it was things like Ravens fire or something like that usernames and anybody who knows about uh, the cartel understands the uh, You know the cartel signaling uh, hang on. Let me just see if I can find um, this but but the reason why I'm saying it is that um, We need to go and actually find the users who are doing this, because these people are intel agents, and we need to find That's the a great point, Catherine. Absolutely. I back you up thoroughly, 100% on that, because that's what's going on currently. You've got, remember that the term conspiracy theory is a CIA concoction, okay? And it was de deliberately created to keep truth from reaching the marketplace, to keep truth from reaching the intelligentsia in the populace. You know, the, the, the term conspiracy theory and the concept cons conspiracy theory were both coined and conceived and created deliberately as a form of military deception and intelligence deception and trickery. OK, it's de deliberately it's a psyop. It's psychological warfare against people. So you remember the last um, techno, one of the things that I pulled up was the bioeffects of selected non-lethal weapons document where the US Army absolutely acknowledges microwave hearing, which puts voices in people's heads. 
you know, and that's one technology that puts voices in people's heads. But it's absolutely amazing that you found this Wikipedia entry with this little note about conspiracy theories. People who are educated today should wake up to this term conspiracy theory. Anytime you see the term conspiracy theory, think CIA trickery, military deception. That's what's really going on. I totally agree. And what I did is I've, I've now taken a PDF printout of this Wikipedia entry with this paragraph in, so um, the conspiracy theory, then with it out when this uh, user made the edit. And then I've also, um, he um, procured a screenshot um, for me where he's actually listed the, uh, the users that were putting the conspiracy theory um, paragraph back in. And the uh, usernames are very interesting because they are one of them is, as I said, Raven's Fire. The other one is called Roxy the Dog. Now, dog is a cartel signaling, a code word, and somebody who has the, the um, dog signaling is somebody who is uh, basically uh, guarding the cartel and is barking at people who are, uh, you know, uh, trespassing on the cartel's things, you know, or sniffing people out. That's the, the dog symbolism. So we've got Roxy the dog, and then we've got Shock Brigade Harvester Boris. Now, harvesting is also a cartel uh, signaling term. So you, you get these, I mean, if I look at it, at the cartel signaling behind these usernames, I would say these are all Intel accounts, Intel slash cartel accounts. But um, this is important because, number one, uh, Wikipedia, um, what is on Wikipedia and is not, very crucially primes people because everybody looks at Wikipedia, okay, at Wikipedia first. So when they put conspiracy theory in there, they prime people to think, oh, yes, it's it's uh, the entire community agrees that this is a conspiracy theory. No, it is not. The paragraph, and we've now got proof for it, has been put in by Intel agents, and they keep putting it back in because this paragraph is super important to them. You know, so it shows the, the falsification of Wikipedia by a targeted action of several usernames, you know, because it's such a fringe article. Why would several accounts force that paragraph back in? You know, it shows concerted action. Um, so this is very important. The other thing why this is really important is because it is a, um, a wonderful example of somebody going after the cartel and actually getting us useful information for court cases. Because once we have documented the fact that intel agencies or cartel members are forcing this entire concept of conspiracy theory onto my, the microwave hearing effect, we can, first of all, we have got three account names, four, perhaps five, that can be linked directly to the cartel. And also we can show their way of action, right? And we can document it for court. So that's super important. Um, and sorry, by the way, before I forget, this is super important for today's episode. Can I just share my screen and show one more detail going back to this incident with Ray McGowan? Because it's reminded me of two other examples that I've seen of people asking a question and then being dragged out. OK, one of them is a guy who asked John Kerry if he's a member of Skull and Bones. He was not just drag, uh, dragged out violently. He was also tasered. And the other one is somebody uh, speaking up during a speech of Angela Merkel and then, you know, expressing his, uh, the fact that, uh, I think that was about immigration and the fact that uh, the government doesn't represent the of the people anymore, holding up a protest sign and quietly sitting down and then being escorted out. But at least the person in Germany was not wrestled to the ground. But um, please, I just would like to point people to the, um, evidence, the video evidence for these cases. Please have a look at uh, the video called Student Tasered after John, Scare uh, John Kerry's skull and bones question. Okay, if you see this, you can actually um, hear the guy being uh, tasered. <laughs> Now come the thugs. Thank <laughs> you. 
so this was a guy being actually tasered. Or maybe it was a street theater actor playing that he was being tasered. Either way, it's the cartel either tasering somebody for real or trying to spread the message that anybody trying to ask a question like that will get tasered, you know? And you can listen to this, and you can listen to this guy's uh, screams. I mean, it's absolutely horrific. And then keep in mind that if a normal per person watches this, they are horrified by the, the screams of agony if a psychopath or sadistic psychopath uh, sees video footage like that, they get, get, they get off on it. They enjoy it, okay? So depending on which side of the fence you're on, it will have a different effect and the cartel uses that. The other video that people should see is in German, but it doesn't matter because this, what he says is not that important. And it says, um, it's uh, Merkel's speech uh, in opening of a research center was interrupted. And now look at this. Okay, danke schön. Ich werde meiner Verantwortung gerecht und werde auf alles achten, dass Deutschland eine gute Zukunft hat und mit der Zukunft beschäftigen wir uns auch heute genau hier. Okay, so can you see the difference? This guy spoke up. And still, I don't understand why after he, so what he's actually saying, I didn't actually spot it the first time, but Merkel is opening a research center, a Fraunhofer research center, right, for the study of microstructures. Okay, I think this is, this is it. Um, <laughs> So this is the Fraunhofer Institute for the Microstructure of um, Materials and Systems. That's what's being opened. And the protester says, I'm really concerned about the future of my children. I'm really concerned. And you as a physicist, uh, Ms. Merkel, um, you are running, you are conducting an experiment and you don't know the outcome. Right, so he might be referring to um, immigrants or many other experiments being done, but um, that's the that's what he says. But anyway, still he's being ex escorted out. Why? Why do people who ask a question like that and express their right as citizens need to be escorted out of the room? I still, when I first saw this thing by Merkel. Um, and I actually thought when this guy was being escorted out by the guy in a suit, I thought, whoa, we have got the Nazis back. But as you now see, this is still nothing to being tasered or being wrestled to the ground and, and actually tortured by a group of thugs, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's the contrast. But I actually think even what happened at the speech of, um, with Merkel, even that is criminal. No one needs to. It is. It is outrageous. And you know, Catherine, that's fantastic that you just showed both of those clips. You know why? It's immense for all of us who are watching the outrageousness of this, precisely what you pointed to. Anybody should be able to stand up in a public gathering and ask a question. What is so fearful and intimidating about asking a question that suddenly, you know, the thug police are pressed into action? and tasers are being used. I mean, what did that young guy ask? Did he just ask, are you a part of a secret society? Something like that? I think he and asked, um, are, you a, uh, are you a member of Skull and Bones? Which John Kerry is, let's just say it for the public, John Kerry is a member of Skull and Bones. Like and George, you know? And Skull and Bones, like the Freemasons, are very much a part of the current day COINTELPRO operations that are being carried out on everybody. You know, everybody who is speaking out against this thug state. Literally, we are living in thug states today, you know, run by thugs. And simple freedom of speech is being squashed left, right and center everywhere. Well, they're saying we're going to take all of the uh, blessings and all of the riches of the United States and keep them all to ourselves because you're not a part of our group. 
That's right. The secret societies, right? Yeah. The, the yeah. little fraternities and frat boys and guys that lie in coffins and uh, baptize themselves with blood, etc. Yeah, exactly. Those jokers. Yeah. The, and it's just, you know, he's my buddy. And, that, and that's all it's based on. Um, you know, somebody may be a brilliant neuroscientist uh, and not get a job because he's not part of the club. You know, so that, that um, basically degrades society. You know, the, the longer it goes on, the worse it degrades society. Oh, it's absolutely degrading society right now. And then yeah. to, use, to use police to do your dirty work for you. You know, if you don't like somebody, you just sick the police dogs on them. Well, and then Ray McGovern was a very knowledgeable person to stand up and speak as opposed to, you know, some guy on the street who, I don't know, uh, basically spend, spent the last 10 years uh, uh, skateboarding. Maybe he's not quite so knowledgeable. <laughs> you know, maybe his question was, uh, you know, maybe somebody like that would ask a question that was just kind of a waste of time, but he still has a right to ask it. You know, but they got rid of a very knowledgeable person making a very valid comment. How do we how do we appoint people to very important American jobs who can't step outside the United States without being arrested? <laughs> and, you know, exactly. And this brings to mind what else is happening currently around us. You have Julian Assange being treated like, you know, a prisoner, a major criminal uh, being put in solitary confinement and tortured in, in the heart of London. You have this other piece of info that came out recently. South Carolina, the first U.S. state to pass a law stating that anybody who criti criticizes Israel is going to be termed anti-Semitic and can be prosecuted. This on the day that Israel engaged in the killing and torture of massive numbers of civilians on Monday, killing 60 people, including a baby. And the, most of the people they killed were like in their teens and early 20s, young adults, teenagers, children being called terrorists. Apparently, the uh, Israeli ambassador in Belgium was recently removed because she called um, the people who were killed terrorists. These were not terrorists. You know, anybody, yeah, should, anybody have should have the right, have to, have the right to, criticize to criticize any nation, any, nation, any policy. Any... Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot and take you cannot... a specific group of people and make it illegal to speak against them or illegal to speak for them. That's just ridiculous. You just throw it open and let the public decide. You know, present your cases, put it on people intellectually to present their case, not arrest them for daring to speak about it. You know, may the better idea win. You know, that, that's just so what's happening. Ludicrous. It is ludicrous. And what's happening is you have a lot of these governments stepping forward and trying to make laws to to suppress freedom of speech. You know, to stop people from speaking out, stop people from expressing their views. If you speak out, here's what you'll get. You know, thug life at the Capitol, breaking people's shoulders and arms and bones, tasering them and so on and so forth. You know, so that's what's really going on. And literally, if people watching this haven't woken up yet, I would say, you know, it's well past time to wake up. And by waking up, I mean, you need to start speaking out. You need to protest. You need to declare non-consent to this massive carnage that's being committed in our name all yes. around us. You know, it's yes. going to come to you. It's going to land at your doorstep very soon. And to your children, if you do not speak out right now. Absolutely. And the guy who was speaking out in front of Angela Merkel was referencing his children. And he was saying, I'm really concerned about um, my children and their future. And are you going to honor your duties as our, you know, as our chancellor? And uh, Angela Merkel actually replied and she, he, she says, OK, thank you for the comment. Yes, I will be um, honoring my duties as the chancellor. Well, <laughs> don't hold your breath, I would say, you know, but um, anyway, I, I think um, that, you know, people need to wake up. That's true. And they need to speak out. And I think now in 2018, because it's so urgent, we need to go a step further because and as far as protesting goes, the UK has shown it had it saw the biggest protest in its history with the protest against university tuition fees, which were still introduced. The protest against the Iraq war was, I think, the biggest in history uh, for the UK, certainly. And it, the Iraq war still happened and still, I think, a million people were massacred. 
and genocided with the full involvement of American and British, and I probably also German and probably behind the scenes, but for sure British. So anyway, so protesting doesn't help. What we need to do is we need to start learning how systems work, and we need to, the only way to pull people out of office, out of the machinery of government, is literally the law, I would say by now. So we need judges of integrity, and we need to now start moving to charge people with criminal offenses and get them into court. And then we need to enforce the integrity of the courts. But first of all, we need to generate all these criminal charges. And that's why I'm really, really, really after the names of the police officers who tortured Ray McGovern. It's, it's super important that we get those names because it's fresh. It just happened, you know, just days ago. This entire thing is still up. And then we also need criminal charges against Gina Haspel from within the United States because Germany is still de facto just a colony, certainly in terms of intelligence work, apparently, according to the heads of Austrian intelligence, Germany is a vassal state, a colony of American, Anglo-American intelligence services. So there's absolutely no good having a, an arrest warrant for Gina Haspel in Germany when it's one of your colonies. Of course, the, general, um, the German general prosecutor is not going to take it anywhere. He can't. But we need an actual arrest warrant from within the United States against Gina Haspel. So people need to prepare that. And the other thing I want to say is that um, when we see scenes like this one, okay, with Ray McGowan being dragged out by a group of thugs, you immediately have to think, hang on, Boon Squad, who are these people? How can we get rid of them? And then the second thought you need to have is this is a panel of criminal. These people are from a criminal organization. They are from a criminal organization. They do not work for America or the American people. They work for an international corporation run by organized crime. Gina Haspel, even if she works for the CIA, she still works for a foreign corporation, for the Crown Corporation, which is run by organized crime. These people do not respond to the pleas of Americans because they work for a foreign entity. That's one thing. So as soon as you see this, the, the Nazi theme, of goon squads, you have to think, hang on, whoever is supervising these goon squads, literally watching, not saying anything, must be part of a criminal network. And yes, these people are. So Mr. Burr and Gina Haspel and everybody else sitting up there is right in with it. Okay. And then when you see the other scene here, the one with John Kerry up there, here it's only John Kerry, watching how a goon squad is dragging out and tasering a young student, you have to think, oh, John Kerry must be part of a criminal organization. He must be part of a criminal network. And yes, he is, because he's part of a Skull and Bones, which can be shown to be a criminal organization. Its members are involved in criminal activity. Okay? Several of its members can be shown to be not just involved in criminal activity, but some of them in war crimes. And that is not a coincidence, okay? Because Skull and Bones is a secret organization as much as the CIA is a secret service and systems analysis can be used to show that any organization that is secret will sooner or later succumb to deep capture by psychopaths and criminals. That's a law of system physics, okay? It's absolutely impossible to circumvent it. And anybody who claims otherwise, um, it reminds me, okay, here, in, uh, in Hungary and in Romania, especially in Romania and the Balkans, uh, we have a lot of machos, okay? It will not come as a surprise. But when the EU first came in, one of the things that they wanted to enforce was the wearing of seat belts when you're driving your car, okay? Now, what we had is this massive resistance, and I'm going somewhere with this, guys. It's very important. But what happened is that these machos, big men, were very resistant to wearing off seat belts because they said, no, I don't need it because A, I'm driving really well, or B, I'm so strong with my big and barely arms, I will not, you know, nothing will happen to me if I crash my car. Now, the simple laws of physics say that above 30 kilometers per hour, let alone above 30 miles per hour, it's physically impossible to actually hold your own weight you know, it's physically impossible. There's no human strong enough. There's, you know, very few machines strong enough to actually hold your weight, which is why these cars just go smash, you know. 
So um, what happened is that people refused to wear seatbelts and they crashed their car and the laws of physics confirmed that it doesn't matter how big your testicles are or rather how big you think your testicles are, the laws of physics still apply to you. Now, what I would like to say to everybody is just as we have laws of physics, we've got laws of system physics that hold just the same. And it doesn't matter how intelligent people think they are, how insightful, how very secretive, how very qualified, the same laws apply which say if you've got a pyramid organization and you've got more than 100 people in it, it will eventually, if the pyramid is tall enough and old enough, it will eventually succumb to deep capture by psychopaths and criminals. That's just the way it is. And this will hold always, this will true, hold true always under any circumstance. So I can tell you that the UN is in deep capture by psychopaths and criminals. Uh, most big banks are. The BIS in Switzerland, as the central bank of central banks is, and this is confirmed by the um, banking whistleblower, you know, who was talking about human sacrifice and the sacrifice of children and so on and so on. But we can also conclude that the same holds true of NATO, the NSA, the CIA, MI6, MI5, BND, any secret service and any organization that's secret, the secrecy and compartmentalization expedites deep capture. It, and it keeps it there for longer. There's no way for the system to recover from deep capture if it's a secret organization. And that's just the way it is. So uh, what I would like to also move the entire world towards is now to think, okay, given that this is a law of system physics, if you want to stop this stuff, what do we have to do? We first of all have to realize we're dealing with pyramids and the top of the pyramid is being run by very few people. So we have to remove only very few people to uh, you know, get the system back into a functioning order. But if we don't remove the people at the top, nothing will change. So as long as Gina Haspel is the head of the CIA, nothing will change because we've got a psychopathic, potentially serial killer, right? Up there at the top, well, what do you expect? She will be acting like a mentally ill woman running an organization that's systemically mentally ill. That's what's gonna happen. But then also systems analysis tells us that at the top, there's quite a thick layer of psychopaths and criminals. So if you get the, the top out, if you get the next layer of management, they're gonna be just as sick in the head. And that's again, a law of system physics. So you need to get rid of quite a lot of people before you get to a layer that even has a chance of not being mentally ill. And uh, you know, one thing that makes it even worse is when you have whistleblowers who are quite demonstratively not mentally ill, but were at the top, for example, like Bill Binney, you can show that they've left the organization because it was so criminal. So they left and the concentration of criminals went up right and that's that's the problem so you know what i'm trying to get at with this is that if we want the cia to even i mean i'm not sure if it can ever return to you know law and order because i don't think law and order was in its statutes from day one right i think it was founded by psychopaths and war criminals um, and the same with the nsa and so on but even if we want to get to a, a functioning state we need to have gina haspel arrested that's my view you know, and we need to have all these people and also these capital police thugs, police and in inverted commas, we need to have them arrested. We need to have them removed from the system. Hi, Ramola, you're back. I was filling the airwaves because you were absent. No, that's fine. I'm having weird interference on my computer. I can tell the cars are zooming up and down on my street and I can bet you anything I'm being locally interfered with. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Okay, because what I'm seeing is a very frozen screen. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'm but I'm glad that something's working. Uh, we may lose you again. You guys had a try with the target with our uh, very interesting conversation this morning, which has traveled various places. And one of the things I wanted to say, um, if um, you know if you will let me, is that um, I, I don't know if we have time really to go into this in detail today, but we will, when we should go into this in detail another day, is to pick up that thread of neurotechnology versus mental 
help that the Miriam Carey story brings to us, you know, because there's been another story in the news and we, we were talking about it a little bit before we got on air, as you may recall, um, about this young science teacher in Richmond, young man, summer cum laude uh, graduate, you know, highly accomplished, clearly, young, full of, um, you know, intelligence, joie de vivre, etc. All of a sudden, apparently, gets in his car one morning, absolutely naked, starts driving into trees, drives into the middle of uh, I-95, a major highway, and uh, gets chased by cops and gets killed. And the guys who killed him, the Richmond police, I gather, this happened just literally two or three days ago. Uh, it's all over the news and it's in Free Thought Project. Check out the article by Matt Agarist in the Free Thought Project, uh, which tells you the story and asks basic pertinent questions, such as, for instance, the chief after, ki after this guy was killed, killed, excuse me, uh, said uh, just because a man is, uh, is naked doesn't mean he's not still a threat. A naked man, you know, rolling on the, fl uh, on the, on the road in the highway, suddenly being, you know, pointed at with a gun and then killed? Why? So, you know, to me, when I look at something like that, and I tweeted this out immediately, is people like this, educated, accomplished people, are not going to get naked and jump in their cars and engage in these things unless they're being neurotacked, unless the mind control technology that we are researching and reporting about is being used on them, you know, to give them the impression, to make them project the symptoms of mental illness. People don't become mentally ill after graduating summer cum laude and becoming accomplished science teachers who are well loved by their families and friends and students. That does not happen. But what is happening increasingly today in our midst, that what's popping up in the news all around us already, this is not even in the future, it's happening now, is neurotechnology is being surreptitiously used in the population to create anomalies like this, which can then be attributed by the authoritarian punitive psychiatry crowd, the same skull and bones crowd, Masonic crowd that we are speaking about, uh, to mental illness. You know, that this is a sign of mental instability, mental illness. We need mental health interventions. We need community mental health interventions because there's a lot of untreated mental illness going around. And we all know about this term untreated mental illness, especially in relation to myself and why this is becoming an issue with me. Just like today, the Child Protection Services has suddenly you know, drawn, their, uh, drawn themselves to my attention. This concept of untreated mental illness has suddenly drawn itself to my attention. And I am most certainly going to be investigating and reporting on both of these subjects in the weeks and months to come because apparently the people who are running these uh, scenarios, child protection, or shall we call it child predation, which is more accurate, um, and you know, untreated mental illness, which is nothing but community mental illness as punitive psychiatry, in the case of people like journalists and whistleblowers who are speaking out, that needs to be investigated much, much further. You know, but this question of neurotechnology being used on people needs to be looked at. The other case that's very similar is the case of the three-year-old, the toddler, the Indian toddler, you know, and Millicent and I have spoken about this. I don't know if we've talked about it on techno. Uh, the three-year-old toddler who was made to stand outside by her father in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. in the morning because she woke up and she woke up her daddy and asked for milk. Indian family, young Indian family. The dad tells her to go stand under a tree outside. She disappears, can't be found. Within two weeks, her body is found. So you have to ask the question, why did this man do that? Okay, you know, I understand Indian culture. I grew up in India, you know. I, I studied right up to, to uh, my first master's degree in India. So I know that there are patriarchal, moronic, thug-like men, okay, who have huge inflated egos and like to throw their weight around. So, may, so there is an element of patriarchy within family life in India you know, that I understand exists. But would a man actually do something so freakish as asking his three-year-old to go stand outside under a tree in the middle of the night at 3 a.m., unless he was severely mind-controlled mind or neurotacked? Now, I don't know if he was. I'm just saying that when this neurotechnology exists, we have to ask that question. 
was this man being neurotect? Was he being radio hypnotized? Because radio hypnosis has been documented in NK Ultra projects and by various other people, you know, by various other neuroscientists. Radio hypnosis is not fantasy or science fiction. And the other Apparently, thing, it's and fact. The other, yeah. The other thing, and that's, yeah. oh, gosh, the case of, gosh, the case of, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Um, one of the things that uh, strikes me, okay, if you get a three-year-old to stand outside under a tree uh, in the middle of the night, that's already okay, pretty freakish and a very rare event. But then for this toddler to this year and then die is also a given and that you need three weeks to find the body. Um, if a toddler dies while staying outside, toddlers typically don't get very far. So um, it would die somewhere around the house. What, of hypothermia in India? Unlikely, unless it's somewhere, I don't know what, in the mountains, okay? It can go get pretty cold. What exactly did the child die of? And then where exactly was it? In a city, in a village community? Because in a village community, anybody who finds a toddler, right, will probably know who it is, right? Whose child it is and would return the child. So to me, this entire thing sounds like the child was trafficked for sacrifice or for abuse. Okay, I mean, sorry, the, the probability of a child just dying away from the house. I mean, do you see what I'm, where I'm coming from? There are so many probabilities of rare events that you would have to concatenate for the story to add up. It's just too unlikely for it to have happened the way it was portrayed. Oh, you know, the father, I know, does he have a history of abusing his children? If he does, okay, maybe he works for a child on trafficking ring. If he does not, what is the chance of a, a dad going randomly mad, then the toddler dying, then the toddler not being found for three weeks? And, and then when the body is not being found for three weeks, what's the chance of it being found? Well, how come nobody dug it away if they just, you know, raped and murdered the child or whatever happened? So there's so much more to the story. So we need to actually ask this question. We need to investigate it because we very much, um, we're very like likely lost the tip of the iceberg of the child trafficking ring in India, which I expect to be vast, you know? What yes. a story. Can you guys hear me soon? Yes, I can now, but I can see that the image is fading in and out. Now it's it's high quality. Oh, okay. Sh shall I tweet it again and say again that they get back together? It seems oh, please to, do. Sometimes. I mean, it's outrageous what they're doing. Um, I don't even know what's going on. I think I'm trying to get into two calls. I can't see myself. But if you can hear me, I just wanted to say the story didn't happen in India. It happened in Texas. What? <laughs> then we are looking at the child trafficking ring in Texas. Pretty much 100%. I mean, yes, and you know I think now I can hear you. It, it okay. just you stopped. kind of went tinny for a minute, Ramola. Uh, yeah, I don't see myself. I don't see anything. Everything sort of crashed. We see you. We see. You. Okay, good. All right. If you can see me. All right. So uh, apparently, this um, this child was an adoptee. And um, after they found the body, they charged the father. Um, With negligence or child endangerment. When did, the, when did the child die? Just before they found her or three weeks pre previous? That's another question. That's a good point. So apparently, um, he reported that Ashurin was missing on October 7th after telling police she disappeared when he sent her outside at 3 a.m. as punishment for not drinking her milk. Ah, uh, my God. And then he waited five hours to report her. And, uh, oh my goodness, all sorts of news. Uh, then, according to police, he says the girl was developmentally disabled and malnourished when he and his wife adopted her, and they had to put her on a special diet that included feeding her whenever she was awake, including in the middle of the night, to help her gain weight. It sounds like an MK Ultra family. Now, what I would like to get into the equation is that we have, we've seen already the, the, the traces of the child theft 
the child kidnapping side of this trafficking ring and then where did the children get trafficked to i mean to children homes and to foster families and given up for adoption to satanic and masonic families who will then abuse them mk ultra whatever them and so on and so on so i'm sorry but this in the middle of the night 3 a.m isn't that the, the cia time limit you know between 3 a.m and 5 a.m that's when they try to disrupt your sleep because you can be mind messed with the best mm. that, what i pff, do, do you see what i mean this story sounds so freakish but when you're looking at mk ultra world it fits everything fits the time the, the freakish punishment for not drinking your milk a totally messed in the head father a child mm -hmm. dying whoa, mm -hmm. whoa. And, and you did catch that it was texas right yeah okay and um apparently there was another child in the family who's now of course been taken away by cps and this this uh family is now fighting for custody yeah gosh i think this case needs uh, some some independent investigators need to get on the case because i think that somewhere there somewhere hidden in that case are traces to the vast child trafficking network in texas somewhere Whoever killed the child, maybe it's the father, maybe it's the foster family, maybe the father was mind controlled. But if he regularly does this sort of stuff, and which seems to be implied by the news article, and we have to keep in mind the article is written by the CIA, right? You know, Operation Mockingbird types, most likely. And even more so if this is, has anything to do with child sacrifice and the child trafficking ring. So we need some invest in independent investigators. I think we do. This article is actually blowing my mind. And if I could actually share my screen, I would do it. I don't. Please, please do it. The problem is I'm having huge issues on my computer. Nothing is working. Can you so read out the title? Because let, me, let me read out this one little bit, which is very bizarre which I just read. First, he initially told police he sent her outside at 3 a.m. as punishment for not drinking her milk. Authorities said he waited five hours to report her missing. But listen to this. He later told police another version of events. He tried to get the girl to drink milk in the garage. As he assisted her, she began to choke, according to an affidavit. Matthew said that she was coughing and breathing slow, and when he no longer felt she had a pulse, he removed her body from the home, police said. The girl's cause of death was still unknown Tuesday. I mean, does any of this make any sense? Not in the least. No. And her body was found in a drainage tunnel a little a little ways away from the house. Whoa. Okay. So, uh, we're, we're, Wait. we're looking at either. <laughs> There's all sorts of conflicting accounts is what's going on because well below those paragraphs, uh, we hear Matthew still believes that after doing an initial search, once he realized his daughter was missing, he went inside and did laundry while waiting for her to come home or for daylight so that he could continue looking. I mean, which one is it? Did he kill her or did he uh, go and do laundry while waiting for her to come home? from yeah. the tree why why is a child a very young toddler being given to foster parents who are clearly clinically insane exactly like, like literally and, and actually not just insane they seem to have a a very careful carefully uh perhaps trained skill to apply mk ultra torture techniques to a toddler and we know that mk ultra has to be applied or you know the methods for monarch programming in mk ultra when the children are very young which is what seems to be happening here so are we looking at a you know monarch programmer who's trying to you know find his way out of uh, police arrest huh mm -hmm. this doesn't make any sense but i all these cases that don't make any sense um we really need a group of investigators on this because I tell you that this is going to be a lead into into this vast child trafficking network. Absolutely. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think whenever you hear stories about children being involved, you know, you have to wonder to what extent the whole child protection service industry is involved. And um, this is very, very disturbing. You know, I initially thought it's a case of just neurotechnology, but um, I'm s perhaps neurotechnology and child protection slash child predation um, are very closely connected. Absolutely. I think every single thing, I mean, even even the, the misreporting or the facts that don't make sense tell you a lot, of, uh, a lot about it. 
but my goodness, I really, I, all the investigators out there who are listening, who have got any connection to Texas or access to information, get on the case. And didn't didn't Justice Scalia also go on a hunting trip to Texas where he died or was died? I thought that was also Texas. Uh, and the Some part of Texas. Was very satanic. I, goodness. I mean, Texas is a big place, right? It just because it's in the same state doesn't mean anything, but it could mean a lot, you know? And, and the fact that it's reported, I mean, what news um, outlet is this reported in? Because I found articles in USA Today, NBC News, Washington Post, which we said is run- I think I was NBA. looking at NBC News, yeah. He died in Shafter, Texas. Yeah. This then, was Richardson, Texas. Oh my goodness. So I think the other thing we have to say, or I would like to put in here, is that they're very cute images uh, of the toddler who's died on the, on the CIA run Washington Post. Okay. Uh, the CIA run Washington Post uh, is making a big thing out of the story, which means uh, we have to ask what the CIA has to gain from the story. I think someone needs to analyze it for cartel signaling. And for also, let's remember what our, um, you know, um, uh, well, our late, uh, you know, friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Paul Marco unearthed, which is that children disappear at one end and are re-advertised for child abuse at another. I'm referring to the Super Bowl advertising, potentially, oh, yeah. um, you know, whistleblower children from the UK um, at the, the, the Super Bowl. So um, perhaps, I mean, you know, it, has the body been identified or is this child just, has the child just been disappeared off the official register to then be sold and be murdered at a later stage? That's also a possibility because sadly the entire chain of, you know, of forensics, the police, child protective services, the entire chain is corrupted. So all sorts of possibilities are, are on the table. And, uh, but should it be something like that, I would expect cartel signaling to that effect in the article, probably by the Washington Post, the CIA run Washington Post. I haven't analyzed the article, but please, you know, get on the case, guys out there and girls, because this is important. And actually talking, uh, maybe I can I can bring it up, are uh, talking about the satanic, the vast satanic child abuse network. Um, hang on, let me, let me, I, because I'm now in Hungary, I want to make a big thing. Oh, yes, I've got one thing to report about Hungary that I still would like to get get in. Um, so do you guys still have um, have something to say about this or can I, can I move to another topic? No, go ahead, because I just wanted to bring up the whole neurotech possibility, you know, that neurotechnology is that sophisticated that it can influence people's moods, their mental states, their brain states, their consciousness levels and their emotions and make them behave in ways that are very foreign to their own personalities. Uh, you know, that's the point I wanted to bring up and I would like to pursue it later on in future shows, but um, I'm done for today. And, you know, we have to think about winding up as well. So let's uh, finish up with whatever we need to. Yeah. Okay, so let me just um, very quickly, um, now that I'm in Hungary, I, I would like to start the Hungary theme because I might as well use the fact that I'm here. This is another European country, totally taken over by the crime cartel. Um, and one of the, there are good news to report. And um, one of the few things I would like to say is based on what I have seen so far, there's something very interesting because outside of Hungary, I know the news reporting about Hungary from um, the UK and from Germany. And there the prime minister, Viktor Orban is literally portrayed like a Nazi, pretty much like Donald Trump. Um, however, when you read the Hungarian news and when you have family and friends in Hungary, the, the image is entirely different. It's actually that that Viktor Orban is hugely popular. He got, I think, twice in a row, um, and once recently, um, an election win of two thirds. So he's got a two thirds majority, and the Hungarian population seem to love him. I know from our family and friends here in Hungary that he has a policy of um, supporting Hungarian families to the extent where if people have three children, Okay, they will get a massive um, loan. I think that they don't have to pay back for mortgage and stuff like that. And he's trying to protect Hungarians from this kind of sharky mortgage um, fraud. 
and Hungarians have been affected by it because the banking cartel has sold um, like really dangerous mortgage loans to the Hungarian population that seemed really attractive because they were uh, denominated, I think, in Austrian, uh, I think, in euros, and the Austrian banks did it. I think, I think this was. I have to update my knowledge of this. But then, what happened is that the Austrian loans that a lot of Hungarians got for their houses in Hungary turned really toxic when the interest rates rocketed. And this is entirely um, guided by the banking cartel, but it bankrupted or nearly bankrupted entire families. And the Hungarian government, I think, had to take over the foreign loans from Austrian banks to protect Hungarians. And I think Aust um, Viktor Orban did that. But it was essentially a move by Viktor Orban against the banking cartel, trying to protect the Hungarian people, which is, I think, what a prime minister should do. Another thing that uh, Viktor Orban tried to do was to uh, throw out the IMF, so the, he paid back the loan that Hungary owned, you know, these toxic um, asset stripping loans by the um, International Monetary Fund. And when he paid that back and actually requested that the IMF leave Hungary, that's when the, um, uh, the German and the UK press went nuts and started calling him a Nazi. So I think his Naziness consists of throwing out the IMF, which I think is a good thing. You know, so the IMF has left um, Hungary quite a long while back, but then the country started booming, and now he achieved throwing out the George Soros Foundation. That is a big thing. So one of the things I would like to show, uh, share with you is uh, now on the quick. The one article I found on this was um, by David Ike, who says George Soros's um, Open Society Foundation ends operation in Hungary. This was published two days ago. And um, he also shows um, big um, posters by um, Victor Orban. I think this is Victor Orban's Fidesz political party um, making, um, so advertising. Um, so here in Hungarian, uh, it says, uh, let's not let uh, George Soros have the last laugh. Okay, so with this campaign posters like that, putting George Soros's face on this campaign specifically, they were trying to oust his foundation and his meddling in Hungarian politics from the country. Um, and I think they got this billionaire slash trillionaire, whatever he is. Um, they succeeded in uh, throwing him out of the country and his NGOs, which were meddling. And then apparently Viktor Orban said, you might understand if I don't cry my eyes out. That's what he said in, when the news broke in April. Terrific. <laughs> Absolutely terrific, yeah. And, you know, uh, there's one sentence that I really liked by, uh, by Viktor Orban, a slogan. Um, and uh, I, I very much think that the, um, all the TIs should adopt the slogan. So Hungary, you have to know that Hungary is a country of, I think, 15 million people, if I remember correctly. And I think about, I don't know if it's maybe even as much as 5 million. Um, has been carved off after World War I, and it's now Hungarians are living outside Hungary's borders, ethnic Hungarians, because the old, old, Hung the old Hungary, was two-thirds of the area was carved off and given to the countries around it, and this was, you know, to break up the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Hungarian Empire. Okay, so Hungary used to be pretty big, you know, one of the big players, and now it's a nothing country, a very small country that has to fight you know, um, um, to... to succeed and actually be heard in the EU and it's being threatened non-stop and one of the biggest stones of contention is that Hungary is refusing to take immigrants because the uh, leaders are saying we need to actually solve the problems within the countries so that people do not have to flee their countries you know we have to solve the problems right there and that's very true you know we, we need to stop the uh the the wars of the big corporations and you know among others of the uh, Anglo-American big secret societies and big, big secret services and big corporations in those countries, you know, instead of then uh, having all this. So this is the, the stance of um, Hungary that is inviting a lot of, um, you know, uh, well, aggression. But then Viktor Orban said that um, we Hungarians, we need to try to achieve the impossible because the possible can be achieved by all the others, right? So this is actually very much what the TIs feel. They have to achieve the impossible, fighting entire governments, entire secret societies and secret services, which are global. But, you know, if you're a TI, you might as well aim for the impossible because, frankly, the possible can be achieved by all the other people, the average people, you know? 
So um, I, I very, very much um, concur with that. But um, just to finish, um, this is really, really close to my heart. Um, I would like to point people. So while I was in Hungary, I was brutally attacked. And I think, I personally think that the aggression does not come from Viktor Orban and the people in government. I think they're trying to do actually valuable work. I think the attacks... Um, on me, which were brutal, by the way. So this morning I was woken up at, I think, 4 a.m., which remembers this a CIA torture time frame of between 3 and 5 a.m. So at 4 a.m. I was woken up and my head chips here on the right-hand side uh, on the top of my skull were turned on to cause agonizing pain. They tortured me for several hours. And then I, I think after seven, I got up and I spoke to the host family. And then they tortured me so heavily that I threw up twice. Okay, this was how my day started today. After they achieved, you know, making me throw up twice, they stopped. And it's actually like a switch. So they stop torturing you and then you can recover. But it took me the entire day to recover from the brain damage and the actual physical damage that the torture did to me. So that, I think, is done by Hungarian intelligence whom I've contacted and they got back to me and they said, oh, we're not in charge of terrorism and fighting terrorism. What do you think we are? Here is the statutory, uh, you know, the founding document under which we operate. So I have to still get back to them, but I will publish my correspondence. But the point I would like to make, which ties in George Soros and the cartel to Hungarian intelligence is the following. If you search for an interview that has been unearthed with George Soros, Admits, so this is how we pronounce him in uh, Hungarian. We pronounce his name as Soros Juli. Okay, that's his original Hungarian name, George Soros. Um, so he was a Hungarian, I think he was a Hungarian Jew in Budapest, and he sold the other Hungarian Jews in Budapest to the Nazis to be carted off, to be murdered. And he was massively involved in that. And then uh, an interview was released where people questioned him about his involvement. He said, oh, yes, well, you know, back in the day, what could you do? But he smiles throughout the entire thing. So his micro expressions in the entire interview are one of glee. This guy's a complete psychopath. But the point I would like to make is that George Soros is a Hungarian. Um, he was involved in the mass murder of Hungarians in Hungary before he got massively rich because the cartel rewarded him for his work, okay? But what I would like to say is that while this is the case and while the entire focus is on him, rightfully so, we need to turn the flashlight, split the flashlight and also divert the other half onto the secret services in Hungary, which have been instrumental and by the way, have been the people grooming George Soros and enabling his work. So in Hungary, the Hungarian secret services who murdered the Jews and put in the entire machinery of cataloging people, carting people off and yada, 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 the entire infrastructure, they have never, ever been disbanded. The Hungarian mass murderers are still here, their entire organized crime families festering within Hungary. And what I would like to say is unless we dismantle the secret services in Hungary, Viktor Orban's project of, you know, regenerating Hungary will not succeed because we have these massive psychopaths running, as now I can confirm from personal evidence, a directed energy weapon system, and they're using it against families. And I've also uncovered huge pockets of what I call medical malpractice and very strange medical diseases that are statistical outliers, like women, every woman in an entire family some of them not um, biologically related, all of them receiving hysterectomies. This is not normal. This is an entire medical malpractice program. And people are being given cancers here. And I would say that I've got now enough data to say with sufficient you know, confidence levels that these are directed energy weapons because I see pockets of very rare diseases, you know, affecting several people, sometimes in the same home, sometimes within 50 meters, sometimes within families where people are not biologically related. So this is it. So I would like to make finish off, give me two more minutes and then I shut my mouth, but this is super important. I want to put Hungary on the map for its good work of ousting the IMF and ousting George Soros and the crime cartel. But I would like to also put Hungarian secret services on the map who I think are Nazi psychopaths are being run by Nazi families and totally criminal families. And I would like to put the entirety of the Austrian-Hungarian empire on the map 
and the Masonic and Satanic influences on it. And I would like to open this case in two minutes flat by pointing people to one particular hotel. Okay, I would like to introduce the New York Cafe in Budapest. It's a very flashy hotel, as you can see from the images that are being flashed up. But I would like to make the following case. Um, I would like to say that the entire child rape, mutilation and murder and the rape and mutilation and murder of women has been a huge business for millennia and that it has made the cartel a lot of money. And therefore, we can conclude that the richest places um, are involved and hotels are a, a prime location where you can more or less anonymously rape and torture children and women. And I would like to make the case that a lot of high flying hotels have been in the business of this, have been hosting the secret services and secret societies, and some of their architecture and their symbolism will reflect that. And I would like to make the case that the New York Cafe in Budapest is one of such places. And I would like to make this case by going to the gallery and showing you what this place looks like, okay? Um, so these are pictures of the building and I would like to make the case that there is huge satanic influences. Actually, the biggest, the, the front of the building isn't here. So let me just type New York um, Cafe Budapest and show you the images. And I want you to take this example and take it to every city, every capital in the world and do the same sort of analysis. Hang on, let me just say, um, uh, uh, devils, uh, hang on. Yes, here. So the front of this hotel, uh, the lamp, the lamps, the lanterns are held by flying devils. Satan appears dozens of times on the facade of this hotel, okay? These are the satanic, hang on, the satanic lantern holders here on the front of this hotel. I don't know how many times, you know, Satan is represented here, but when you go into this hotel, Satanism is advertised on its front, okay? That's the type of hotel I'm talking about. And then inside, I would like to analyze some of the images um, number one, here, you have columns representing snakes. You will see the same four snake columns in the Vatican, um, in, uh, in the, um, the main uh, basilica, okay? The same four snakes. Now, this is a satanic reference. It's a reference to the organized crime cartel, okay? So have a look at these images. The other things you should see is that inside... Um, uh the um the frescoes you will see satan frolicking i would say also uh raping some women and then inside the image you will see a reference to the uh jesuits and the sun worship um in the form of a sunflower okay there's no reason for sunflower to be painted here but the sunflower looks at this scene of rape or sexual frolic and you'll also see references to other devils hid, hiding and watching and then to little nude boys as well and look at this funnily shaped object behind the nude boys rectum okay now that's painted on the ceiling of this place um, and then please look at the frescoes of the nude boys uh, riding the black sheep Okay, nude boys, nude boys, nude boys, nude boys in miscellaneous sexually alluring poses. Okay, now this is how this uh, entire place was set up. Then you also see fountains with a devil's head and a man kind of inviting a woman to some sort of pleasurable activity. And this is above a fountain, right, that very easily can serve as a sacrificial fountain where you when you cut babies' heads off, you collect the blood. If you don't think that this sort of stuff goes on, just look at the Hampstead cover-up, okay? But um, what I would like to say is that you have these sort of symbols everywhere in the architecture. You have devils hidden in the architecture, okay? And this sort of stuff proliferates in Hungary. And should you think that um, the um, connections to the cartel have been stripped, you will get dessert served 
with a serpent motif at the back should there be any sort of mystery about this place now one thing i would like to finish off with um is to say uh the new york cafe and uh, new york cafe budapest okay new york what's the reference to new york there but when you look at wikipedia you will find out that this hotel the new york palace in budapest okay so the building was constructed in 1894 by the new york life insurance company now insurance is a prime business of the cartel all right so the um the uh this was the local head office okay so that's a connection to the cartel i would like to say um the building was designed by the uh, um, architect um alias hausman and so on and so on the building opened on october 23rd 1894 so this takes the entire satanic network back to the um, 19th century um okay then you had the new york cafe being the ground floor has been a long time center for the hungarian literature and uh, center for hungarian literature and poetry maybe we can look into who these people were perhaps they had some sort of you know uh ring-like trafficking activity um the facade of the building right has 16 imposing devilish forms which is the work of Kar karoy uh, senyei okay so heck knows who he was but now very importantly after the collapse so the building was nationalized during the communist era after the collapse of communism the structure was bought by the italian italian boscolo hotels chain in february 2001 the building was totally renovated and reopened on may 5th 2006 as a 107 room luxury hotel okay so I would like to finish off by saying that that hotel is the tip of the iceberg of the Hungarian satanic trafficking rings that has been operational in Hungary since the 19th century. And there are buildings like that literally every 100 to 200 meters in Budapest. Okay. It's massive. This thing is massive. And these prime hotels have always been traditionally the place where this trafficking took place. And not least because high-flying um, diplomats and um, heads of state who would have to refresh their control files would visit hotels like that. That's very interesting, Catherine. It sounds like you're saying that there are lots of hotels like that. And so there's a sort of a real visible presence of these Satanists doing their dirty deeds in public. In yes. broad daylight, you know. Yeah, and I'm saying it, it has been so prolific in Budapest that um, they, they were not shy of putting it overtly into the architecture because I'm not the first, per I mean, normal people went and dined in these places and I don't think I'm the first person to hiccup at the sight of, you know, Satan 16 times on the facade, nude women being raped by Satan and nude young boys. I think, you know, people uh, could put, they add one and one together or going back to the 19th century. So this shows you how overt the pedophile networks and the satanic rape and mutilation networks were. And I guess what I'm trying to say is when it's so in your face that secret societies are operational and, and you know, trafficking rings, secret services must have been involved. Okay, that's what I'm saying, basically. I'm saying that if you look at the architecture, you can see the depravity in Budapest, and this will mirror the depravity and the secret services 100%, simply because by being secret, they will be in deep capture, you know? Yes, and secrecy is, the, is at the core of it, isn't it? Because as long as there is secrecy, and there's secrecy that is protected by, by so-called consideration for national security, you know, and that's why you find uh, some of these criminal networks hiding in the secret services, hiding in the intelligence agencies, hiding in the, in the US in the fusion centers, possibly, you know, um, because there is that secrecy that permits that. Um, we don't know to what extent this kind of um, horror is prevalent and um, how, how far it extends the magnitude and scope of this atrocity where there are actual pedo criminal networks that have infiltrated intelligence agencies, infiltrated the military in the US as well. 
So, um, and that's unfortunately connected, as we said, to the child predation industry, and there are many analysts who are doing work on that. So as you say, yes, I think there's a lot that still continues need to need continues to need to be analyzed. Um, there is a continual need uh, to analyze and excavate and understand further. One point I wanted to make was because you mentioned that the Hungarian Secret Services came, kind of came out from those people like, you know, the Soros and so forth, other people who actually put down other Hungarian Jews, um, you know, and I think Mullins has mentioned in his estimation that it was the uh, anti-Zionist Jews who are kind of emasculated throughout Europe by the Zionist Jews. You know, and the Zionist Jews, he connects also with the Nazis. So, and the Nazis, there are connections there with the British because the Nazis are considered to be a concoction or a creation of the British and American bankers. So it goes back to the heart of the crime there, you know, to the bankers. It goes back to money and insurance and um, all of that stuff. Um, and in the U.S., as we know, the Project Paperclip Nazis uh, continue to be here because the progeny are here now. And uh, it's, it's believed definitely among the people who, um, inside the secret services, even inside the security agencies, who understand there's been a coup in this country, that this country has been taken over um, by the Nazis, you know, by the people uh, in these secret societies and the Nazis, who the progeny of those paper club Nazis, uh, presumably, um, you know, who are running now Stasi and totalitarian and fascist operations on the rest of us. So more reason for us to um, challenge, open, expose, protest, speak out, uh, withdraw, withhold our consent, and declare non-consent to this, you know, extremely execrable situation that we are all being faced with currently. So that's my last word for the day. Karen, did you want to um, round us off here? Um, well, I'm going to go on to just a different uh, topic very quickly. I had told people I was writing and sending out packets, and I've gotten back uh, the last of the uh, three. I sent out six for the first round. And so we shall see in the mail uh, whether the Department of Justice and FBI have a uh, answer for me. And then we'll see what to do after we get those answers, how to refine our queries. Um, to reiterate, I wrote to, I wrote, sent three packets to the FBI, to their inspector general office, to their civil rights office, and to the director. And I sent the same packet to the same entities at the Department of Justice. So we shall see what each of those uh, departments has to say. And like I said, I'll readjust depending on what they say. And we'll just keep plugging along. And thank you for the people who contribute their signatures as well. If we get, no, I didn't leave people out. There's not a select few. There's a sampling is what, what I ask for. And if we get a positive response, I'll ask for yet more. So we're just going to uh, see what they do and then zig and zag as they do and see if we can further our way down the path. That's wonderful, Karen. Thanks so much for working on that because I think you're working on it for everybody. You know? Right. So it's very, very helpful. So on that note, if anyone doesn't have any last words to add, I guess we should just uh, close the session. Wish everybody um, a good evening in Europe, I guess. And uh a good day or good afternoon in the U.S., at least on the East Coast, and um, good morning on the West Coast. Um, and I forget what other times of day elsewhere in the world. So anyway, have a good rest of your day or night, wherever you are, and we will see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.